Hello everybody, my name is Jacob Seavey and today I'm going to be talking about how to find the mass of a galaxy using the divergence theorem. Now this has some very interesting results because you would assume if you could find the mass of every individual object you can see, all these stars, black holes, gas clouds, etc, and add it up, that would be the mass of the galaxy. However, what you actually get is a value that is higher. Now, the way that you want to approach this is by imagining each of the individual stars in a galaxy that you can measure as mass points. If you see them approaching you, they do something called blue shifting, where the wavelength, the certain peaks that you see, are slightly to the left of where they would normally be. So you have this faint little shadow of everything having a shorter wavelength. And the same for when they leave except instead in that case, they become longer wavelengths uh, and are red shifted, have a slightly red tint. This is a, simply the Doppler effect for light for the object emitting them uh, going away from you. And you can tell where the base peaks are supposed to be due to the overall <clears throat> emission of certain frequencies for your specific uh, material. Hydrogen has certain emission wavelengths. Um, every element there is, and even compounds, will emit certain light when excited. So from this, you can tell how fast part of it is uh, going towards you and how fast part of it is going away from you, as if it was a simple spinning object. It is not uniform. It is uh, not necessarily straight forward like a simple solid object because it's not, it's a, essentially a cloud of points. And if you visualize that, each individual mass point will have a internal G as well as a outward uh, DA. Think of it as a weight on the end of a rope and you swing it around. The distance you're swinging it at is R naught that is the overall radius of its orbit. And these two points will be equal. Sorry, these two vectors will be equal. Your outward and inner forces are equal. That way they are in equilibrium. And if they were not in equilibrium, if the outward force was stronger, you wouldn't see solid galaxies where they are clumped together. They would just be a, uh, the entire sky would be a cloud of random stars where they're not held to the galaxy, and they fly off. We don't see that, so we know that these two forces are in equilibrium, and you can set the internal force of gravity equal to the outward centrifugal force, or simply inertia. And with those two equal, you can start calculating from that rotational speed. Now, depending on the type of galaxy you have, you'll get different values. A simple spherical cloud is going to have very, a very different uh, gravity vector field compared to a flat uh, disk galaxy. And a disk galaxy is going to be more simple than something like a spiral galaxy, where it not only matters the, the phi, the uh, orientation from the top rotated down, in this case, the phi starting from zero to two pi, not only would that matter, but in a spiral galaxy as well, the theta as it rotates around would have different forces of gravity. So we are going to use this equation. This is a relatively simple vector field uh, for gravity negative a over r naught cubed times r times the unit vector r and down here negative a over r squared times the unit vector r respectively for when r is less than the shape disk the r naught and for when it's greater than when it's equal to r naught it doesn't matter which one you use because they come out the same r cubed and an r on top that cancels just to give you an r squared on the bottom. Intrinsically, this part makes sense. 
the negative because the R naught, or sorry, the R hat, the unit vector is saying it's always directly outward. That's the direction of gravity. However, you know that gravity pulls inward only. That's why we have a negative. The unit vector points out, so you have to flip the sign to have it point inward towards the center of mass. Going further, we have to apply it using this equation. This may seem out of nowhere. Uh, however, there's a great paper on this by a Dr. Simpson from uh, Prince George's Community College, where they go from the general Newtonian form, the uh, force of gravity is equal to the gravitational constant times mass one, mass two, all over r squared, into this. It, uh, it's a great breakdown step by step. Uh, that would be a whole different presentation. That's not what I'm talking about. Uh, but it is definitely worth a read. It helps you have a better understanding of where this comes from. This is just Gauss's law for gravity. And it is incredibly helpful um, because everything here we have, except for the thing we're trying to find. This is just the mass density. The mass of a given area, or sorry, volume, over the volume. And that's not going to be constant. If you have, for instance, a cloud of different stars. It's much more likely for there to be a large clump in the center than towards the outward. You might have hundreds of stars in one volume, and then the same volume towards the edges of the galaxy are going to have you know, only a dozen or so. So the mass density does change. However, this equation uh, can help you find the mass of the overall galaxy. All right, and now that we have the uh, equations for the gravity vector field and an equation relating g, the vector field, and a mass density in order to get mass, we need to talk about how to actually apply these equations. So, simply restating it to start. What we have is a gravity vector field, negative four, pi the constant, g the gravitational constant, and rho here. What you can do with rho is that is the mass over a volume. It isn't necessarily constant, but if you integrate over said volume, you end up with just the mass enclosed in an area. So in order to integrate, we have to integrate this side with respect to volume, and you can either use dv or tau. Uh, either way is the exact same thing. Just saying v. We do have to do it to both sides. And a bit short on space. But this really helps shorten thing out. Because on the right hand side, all the constants can come out. None of these are changing at all. Those are just constant values. The integral v, if you wanted, you could also write it as a triple integral because we are in spherical coordinates. We are integrating over a sphere. Uh, it would be 0 to r naught uh, as our final values. You would have between these two, theta and phi, somewhere in there. Uh, 0 to pi for phi and 0 to 2 pi for theta. And this whole thing is simply equal to the mass enclosed. So make sure you keep in mind that m in is a mass enclosed and not a minimum. Now we have this side pretty solved. We have the right side almost entirely solved. However, the left side is still, it's an integral with a, a dot product inside. And because that whole thing, uh, a three-dimensional or a triple integral with a dot product inside is a little complicated, we can use the, <coughs> the uh, div theorem or 
uh, Gauss's theorem. So what that says is simply You're turning a volume integral into a service integral. And in our case, it comes out even neater because we are integrating over a sphere and because our uh, equation is multiplied by the r hat. In other words, our normal is the same thing as the direction of this. R is always going to be facing outward, uh, and so our normal of a sphere is also simultaneously directly outward. Meaning we can plug this straight in, get this side exactly as is, already done, and the right side will be just like that. So from there, I'm just going to write it over here, right underneath. All we have left is our v function, which in this case is written with a g because it is a gravity equation as we have been denoting. And now it is d sigma because it has changed slightly there. All right. And that is still equal to the right hand side. And because we did change the equation a little bit, I'm going to write it like this. I'm going to write out what the surface is and what our V is. And however, here we do need to add the Jacobian before doing this would be d phi d theta. And the Jacobian here is r squared and sine phi. These normally you would remove from uh, r here and turn them into r naught simply because we are taking a shell at r naught. But because they cancel out, I'm going to skip that step. Just cross them out. So we have a really straightforward integral here. That's the good thing about taking the shape to be a nice sphere, as well as our uh, gravity function being of the super, super straightforward uh, vector field of a perfectly spherical galaxy. In that case, it is not a, uh, the overall gravity is not dependent on any sort of theta or phi. Notice this equation is just in the r direction, meaning any direction you're pointing uh, is going to have the exact same gravity facing inward. It is a sphere. Uh, the only thing that changes it is how far out you are. That's why the only variable in this case is the r variable. You don't have a theta or a phi changing like you would if it was a spiral galaxy or a disk galaxy, where in those cases you have a unbalanced gravity forces pulling in different directions. It would still overall point inward, but then it would be dependent on those other variables as well. Now here we have a very straightforward integral. Thanks to all of that that we've already done. leaving the constants in just because it is so short. Negative, negative. So turning that positive. That is zero to two pi. 
Uh, so this is going to be negative 1 minus positive 1. So negative 2a. Now d theta with theta not in there. So it's going to be 2 pi times the inside minus 0. But because the 0 is uh, extraneous, you can simply write Now this is not the overall equation for mass. Remember, we are trying to find mass, and this is simply what this left-hand side equals. So we have solved for the volume uh, integral. However, we have not solved for our rho variable, or as we solve for it, m enclosed here. So what we can do is simply plug this part back in for the uh, gradient dot g meaning we have a nice and simple and now we're at the very last second or second to last step I should say in order to find m enclosed just divide by all of these constants. And what you get, almost everything cancels out. A over G is equal to the mass enclosed. And that is how measuring the rotation of certain points through their blue shifting and red shifting shows you that the mass inside a galaxy is actually much higher than it is when you're simply uh, checking each individual star and summing them up, meaning there has to be another source of mass that doesn't interact with light at all. Uh, it doesn't interact with the electromagnetic spectrum, but it does have mass. And because we can't see it and it does not interact with the light, we call it dark matter. And that is how you can apply this function. Thank you very much. So we have the divergence theorem, as well as the wonderful equation from the Dr. Simpson. And you can find both of those here. Boas having the divergence theorem in the textbook, as well as a few other examples of it, including uh, electrostatic charge, some interesting stuff. And then Dr. Simpson has a amazingly uh, simple to understand and yet very comprehensive breakdown of how you actually get the seemingly random equation here from a very well-known Newtonian gravitational equation, g is equal to big G m1 m2 all over r squared. Thank you very much.